Hey everybody, Nick here. I wanted to go over a, a difficult removable case, or maybe not difficult in, in its execution, but difficult in its diagnosis so that we get a predictable outcome. As many of us know, removable dentures uh, or removable prosthodontics in dentistry can be rather challenging to the point where uh, clinicians prefer not to do uh, engage in that discipline at all. Uh, what I hope to do through some of these cases is bring some clarity on what we can look for to increase the predictability uh, in the execution of, of dentures, partials, combination cases, so on and so forth. So I wanted to go over this case here. I call it the quandary of denture jaw relations. And I think we'll, we'll get a strong sense of what the quandary was and what I did as I discovered that in the, in the operatory and what I did about it. So the goals of this case vignette is to see how we address a complex jaw relations appointment for a patient with a history of chronic drug use. And we'll see why the chronic drug use uh, had a specific role in the um, difficulty of this case. We're also gonna learn how to evaluate jaw relation cases from the lab before the patient arrives. We'll call this efficiency evaluation. In other words, not waiting for the patient to arrive to realize that the lab didn't do what you asked them to do. Uh, how to use enamelplasty to aid in occlusal leveling, leveling for a removable pros case. Very important tool to have in the toolbox, especially with a case like this. So before we get started, I wanted to take a look at this simple diagram that we all saw in dental school, which has to do with vertical dimensions. Uh, I'm going to go over these somewhat um, annoyingly only to drive the point home because understanding these to the, um, to the deepest level will help us avoid situations where removable prosthodontics is difficult. So here we have two acronyms, VDO, VDR, vertical dimension of occlusion. We can think of that as um, the patient's vertical dimension when the teeth are in maximum intercuspal relationship or position. Um, essentially the patient's biting together and whatever stops them, in most cases it's the teeth, uh, what is that vertical dimension as measured from extra oral landmarks? Nothing earth shattering here. Uh, where I went to school, we were taught to put pieces of tape here with a, with a Sharpie to delineate a fixed position on the maxilla and a fixed position on the mandible as those two entities are not one and the same. Nothing earth shattering here. Uh, many ways to, to do that. <clears throat> the second acronym here, vertical dimension of rest, is what we can call the neuromuscularly uh, neutral position. That's essentially where the jaw will go with the least amount of muscle activity. And there's a lot of um, variability into exactly how to find this uh, particular position, uh, which is not the object of today's conversation. With that said, uh, I'll just share that we use a combination of uh, swallowing, speech, and the emma, emma is a sound that's made that often will result in a patient approximating this vertical dimension of rest. So understanding these two concepts is critical. It's taught in dental school, but it, like many things in dental school, kind of fades away as it doesn't necessarily show up in clinical practice. This is one of the concepts that we have to bring into clinical practice. Um, what I would say here is mastering these two concepts, whether you're doing dentures or not, is what would make you a very good dentist, okay? So one thing we're going to talk about is the difference between these two. I'm going to call that the freeway space. The freeway space is essentially a space given to the mandible to do things like masticate, produce phonetics, the swallowing pattern. Again, the VDR is driven by neuromuscular activity so it would stand to reason that where the mandible exists in the lower arch or in the in the uh, oral vault is driven greatly upon dependent upon neuromuscular activity when we say neuro what we're saying is the brain is driving it so if the brain is driving it wouldn't it make sense that during mastication which is a centrally mediated process phonetics when we're producing words these are all things that are driven by the brain, therefore controlled by nerves through the muscles. It's very easy, at least in my dental school education, to believe that all of these are anatomically derived entities, 
which to some degree they are, but I like to think of these as more, not so much anatomical, but physiological through the neuromuscular activity. Why is that important? Well, the freeway space is not a static position. It's a dynamic position, meaning uh, things are moving within that, that space. Understanding how to uh, use this information in removable prosthodontics is not straightforward. It's, it's easy to miss and still be okay sometimes. But the goal here in this uh, particular case vignette is to understand how this information was absolutely critical in me understanding how to handle this case. So I want to go move forward here. Um, I'm going to hit play and I'll pause it every now and then as I'm talking. Uh, when I did this video, what I thought I was going to going to share is a little bit different than what I'm trying to do here. Uh, but I think it'll make sense as time goes on. Again, we have a patient who has had some chronic drug use and we'll see how that plays a role here. And as I'm talking, we're going to think about these three concepts. The VDO, which is essentially where his jaws come together in three-dimensional space. Now he has a pretty worn dentition or pretty eroded dentition. So this particular dimension, uh, we are actually going to rehabilitate and we'll see why that's important. The VDR position is something that we should be able to find irrespective of the VDO so that we have a sense of how to create this freeway space while also maximizing aesthetics. Uh, this interocclusal distance down here is the same distance as the freeway space. It's just another way of measuring um, or referring to the space that exists between maximum aesthetics, MIP, and then that neuromuscular position or freeway space. Okay. All right, here we have Doug. Uh, this is an interesting removable case that I think is worthy of a quick discussion here. So wax rim came in. The wax rim was set very well by the lab. I tried it in and based on his rest lip position, the wax rim looked good. So I had marked the midline, marked his canines, maximum smile line. Then I had him bite down and I, I got the sense that something wasn't right. So then I started, I found his VDR and I started. So VDR, um, finding that position is dependent upon a variety of different methods as we talked about before. And we're just gonna, I'm just gonna use the EMA method. So having the patient say EMA, um, after they're done saying that word through the use of neuromuscular activity of saying the word EMA, um, we tend to end up in a position that's neuromuscularly balanced which can approximate the VDR. Again, there, there's lots of different tools and techniques that we can use here, uh, but I just want to share what I was doing to try to find his VDR, vertical dimension of rest. I was getting the sense here as I was doing this case that um, his vertical dimension of rest did not leave me a whole lot of space to create a VDR, but also maximize his aesthetics. As we know, the upper wax rim is more or less driven by aesthetics and then the vertical dimension is driven by the occlusal surface of the wax rim and or the lower uh, wax rim and or natural teeth so there's a balance here sometimes when we're trying to maximize aesthetics but trying to alter the vdo in a way that is maximally functioning reducing until i got vdr minus three for his vdo the problem was i kept going and going and going i couldn't get that spot I'm asking myself, if the aesthetics look really good on the upper rim, why am I so far away from the VDO? So I started thinking, um, patient has lower <clears throat> canine to canine, <clears throat> nothing in the posterior. We have a wax rim, but before on the lower, but before I try the lower wax rim, I need to get the natural teeth in place. So I kept reducing, kept reducing until I got to this point here. And that's when I stopped and I said, something doesn't add up. So I started scooping out the lingual so that I could maintain the facial, but capture a vertical bite record of his natural teeth. And I kept scooping to the point I couldn't scoop anymore. So we're going to have Doug put this back in. I just want so that scooping methodology is often needed when the patient has uh, compensatory eruption of the lower anterior teeth. We're going to go over this in a moment. This is kind of where the case started to get a little interesting. 
Suffice it to say that when we're adjusting the wax rim, we don't necessarily have to adjust the entire wax rim. We can leave the wax for the lab to place the facial surfaces of the anterior teeth where they belong aesthetically, but then at an angle, and as you'll see here, this is what I did, at an angle, uh, create the vertical dimension uh, of occlusion at a different point in space. When they're drastically different, you have to do that scooping technique. Otherwise, you're going to compromise one or the other. I want everybody to see, <clears throat> see what I'm talking about. I've lost the aesthetics, but I'm closer to the VDR. So go ahead and smile big. So what do I mean by that when I, when I lost the aesthetics? Well, I kept reducing the wax rim until I was getting the freeway space that I needed. Again, the freeway space was derived through the Emma, Emma position. So that vertical dimension of rest minus three millimeters, which was what was what I was trying to do, kept getting me um, tripped up with the wax rim, which told me I had to reduce more and more and more and more and more. The problem was I was losing the aesthetics of where the teeth eventually were going to go. And we're going to see why that happened. Again, coming back to his, his drug history. As we can see, he has to smile pretty big just to get a few millimeters. Go ahead and say 55. 55. Let it relax. 55. 55. Smile big. So as we can see here, I'm limited by the interaction of these lower teeth here, which are asymmetrical from here. So if the upper wax rim is correct based upon his um, skeletal structures and skeletal plane, I got to get these to come together better. So what I started doing is scooping out just this side. And I basically ran out of space. So I asked the question, are the lower teeth actually overly erupted? So I asked the question, did, did you grind before? I didn't start this case, so I, I didn't necessarily know where he started. But as we can see, he did lose a lot of tooth structure from this image here. So one can easily conclude that. So this is a picture of his um, preoperative uh, diagnostic records done with a different provider prior to me starting here and I, I'm sure somebody watching the video sees the decay on number 22. Um, this was the first time I had seen the patient. Um, he has nothing on the upper so we're rushing pretty fast to get him an upper denture and then we're obviously going to take care of the lower teeth. So I can appreciate that that's a little backwards. Um, clinical dentistry is not always so cut and dry and clean. With that said, obviously we're going to clean up the lower arch once we get the upper teeth in place so that the man can enjoy food and smile. Uh, but again, these records were taken some time ago and you can see, you know, how much erosion, attrition, degradation of his occlusal plane has occurred due to, I don't want to say the drug use in and of itself, the drug use and the oral hygiene that came with it. Uh, suffice it to say, this man has a very, or had a very collapsed vertical dimension. Um, Although that's tough to say sometimes. We can't necessarily say he had 100% collapsed vertical dimension. He might have had what we call compensatory eruption. As the upper teeth wear, the lower teeth will, will drift into that space. And we can definitely see that in some other photos shortly. That based upon his pattern of erosion and attrition, that the lower teeth have super erupted, which isn't surprising. If you draw a line from the canine to the canine, that zone there is potential super eruption. The lower teeth are in the way of me setting his upper teeth in the right spot. Based on so that's the whole crux of this case. Because his lower teeth had erupted so much within his space, the vertical dimension of rest, minus three millimeters, does not leave me enough space to give him freeway space while also putting the upper teeth where they need to go. Now, if we don't understand this, more often than not, we might be okay. Patients can tolerate and they can adapt to um, miscalculations in this freeway space. But in this patient in particular, there was zero room for us to make, it, make an error. As a matter of fact, there was negative space. And we're going to talk about how we handled that. The point is that sometimes we don't have the freeway space. And when we don't have it, we have to ask why. We know from super eruption in this particular case uh, which is a common reason this happens, but also what do we do about it? On aesthetics and VDR 
position of it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna enamel plasty the lower. We could do some composites on the lower right. The problem is I'm still gonna be in the way. So I'm gonna be infringing upon his VD, VDR. So I want his VDO to be minus three from the VD, VDR. And the only way I can do that is to enamel plasty or remove the teeth, which we're not gonna do. So I'm gonna do an enamel plasty and I'm gonna enamel plasty until I can get a nice flat. Now keep in mind this photo was from before he had the uppers removed. So I'm talking about the lower teeth when I say enamel plasty. Uh, one might say, why not just reduce the upper wax rim? I did that until I couldn't anymore. So we can't always gain space in one direction. Sometimes we have to go in the other direction. Well, th there's teeth there, uh, but those teeth are in a abnormal position in re relevance to his VDR. And enamoplasty is something we have to consider. And done it many times. Patients do very well with it. Um, it's not the magic bullet, but it is a tool in the toolbox to get us from point A to point B. And based on this patient's presentation, he was more than happy to have enamoplasty done if it got him a functional and aesthetic upper denture. Lower occlusal plane to the upper wax rim that I currently have. First thing I'm going to do is add the wax back so I get a nice, let's go back to Doug. Go ahead and open. So I'm going to add to the wax rim probably two millimeters to get them back to where I want it aesthetically. And then I'm going to enamoplasty the lowers until I get that VDR minus three. All right, so here's a, an image I pulled off the, the internet that shows what happens to lower teeth when upper teeth wear. So it's just a stock photo. But we can see here we get what's called an exaggerated curve of SPI. Um, class two situations tend to lend themselves to this. Um, lower over eruption of the anterior teeth, compensatory eruption. These are all terms used to describe this situation. Let's just say this is the green line is where the teeth used to be. Now, before we, we talk about what happened with the lower teeth, you can also see that in this particular photo, which is not too dissimilar from our patient in the case vignette, how much eruption the upper teeth have done. So it's easy to conclude here that this patient has lost vertical dimension when in reality, true loss of vertical dimension is, is somewhat rare and it tends to happen when patients are you know, much farther down the road compared to where this patient is here. Now our patient, um, Doug, we're going to talk a little bit about whether he lost vertical dimension or not. But the point here is we often haven't lost vertical dimension when we see this. The reason is these teeth, the anterior teeth, have over erupted. If we draw a line from the canine to the canine, we can see that there's probably three to four millimeters of pink gingiva here uh, that probably wasn't there when the patient's teeth had erupted. They, the cervical margin of their CEJ was probably up here, but as the incisal edge wore, teeth will always move until they find resistance, and it just kept erupting, 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 erupting as it was getting eroded and or attrited um, to the point where we are here. So the point is teeth will move and, and erupt until they, they find that sweet spot. And what we're left with is inadequate prosthetic space to do our dentistry. But without getting too much into what we would do here uh, in a dentate situation, from a diagnosis, diagnostic perspective, we always have to ask the question, did the patient truly lose vertical? And nine times out of 10, when you see this, if you look at the posterior and you see the relationship of the posterior teeth, you'll often see that the posterior teeth have not worn that much. And this is obviously starting to get down advanced diagnostics, but the point is, be very careful to jump to the conclusion the patient has lost vertical, or at least purely vertical. Compensatory eruption is the snake in the grass much of the time. So there's the, di there's the distance uh, that has been created due to erosion or attrition in this patient, and as we can see, the lower teeth have erupted into that space. We see this a lot with class two patients that don't necessarily have wear in great part because their sagittal discrepancy um, causes the over eruption of the lower anterior teeth and sometimes the upper anterior teeth. We'll call that those deep bite cases, class two deep bite cases. The point is these things exist in our patients each and every day and they're easy to overlook as we 
um, try to solve patients' isolated tooth problems, we forget that there's a system and teeth live within that system. It's good to have this diagnostic ability. Here's another example of an exaggerated curve of SPI or anterior mandibular anterior over eruption due to a variety of factors. These complicate cases. Understanding that this is here uh, will make you a better dentist as you start to provide solutions. All right, so back to our patient, Doug. Uh, as we can see here, he's probably lost some vertical as his posterior teeth have erupted into the space. Uh, he did not have a, um, a centric contact to hold his vertical open as all of his teeth wore. So in this case here, this is a mixture of loss of vertical plus significant over eruption due to attrition and erosion. So back to our case here. So we got our, you know, we got our wax rim back to the vertical dimension of aesthetics based upon his upper lip. So go ahead and open Doug. As we can see, we got our midlines, our canines, our maximum uh, smile line. So we got our, you know, Now what's important to note here, what the lab sent me initially was actually pretty good. I was using, um, how can I say this? I ended up reducing all of that pink. So that pink was all yellow when it came back from the lab, but I over reduced it because I was trying to chase that balance between aesthetics and his VDR. Unfortunately, I realized I couldn't do both. So I added the pink back and that's what you're seeing here. And now I'm gonna maximize aesthetics of the upper wax rim and then remove or reduce or enamel plasty the lower teeth so that I create the freeway space, not by going up in the wax rim, but by going down in his natural teeth. As you can see, we got our midlines, our canines, our maximum uh, smile line. Go ahead and say 55. 55. 55. 55. So I'm a little inside his wet dry line. Say 55 again. 55. So I want to add some more wax to the facial here. Okay, go ahead and open. So there's the wax rim before I added some, some pink wax. And what I want to make, make a note here, um, labs will sometimes create almost like a vertical dimension in this anterior area here. Um, what the lab doesn't have is they don't have the patient. So there are times when we have to accentuate or uh, procline the wax in the maxillary interior to one, give the patient proper lip support, but also provide a incisal edge of the future anterior maxillary interior teeth to give us the fricatives that we need by having that uh, wax rim land on the wet dry line. So this is something that we would see coming back from the lab. And then we see what I did here. I added more pink wax on the facial here to give us more of a proclination that better suited this particular patient's uh, need for lip support and lower lip position so that the fricatives could be enunciated. All right, so we have our wax rim. I added to the facial this, this more exaggerated angle. A lot of times the lab will send it back in a more vertical the way to tell where this needs to go is based upon the fricatives. So you had the patient say 55, and in that other video, I think we got a pretty good sense that he was uh, very deficient in the three-dimensional position of the future teeth based upon his ability to do the fricative. Then we did some enamel plasty of the lower, and as we can see now, 22 through 20, well, 24 and 25 are a lot flatter now in relation to the other teeth. Now, all right, so Sorry we have about our that. wax we're rim. Come back to that. We get a video. So here I was talking about the fact that I did enamel plasty on the left side, and it's not a tip. It's not uncommon to have a non-symmetrical aspect to that over eruption. As we know, patients' tendency to grind, brux, clench. Uh, is not always bilateral or symmetrical. So as this person lost their tooth structure when the upper arch was becoming um, destroyed, it's not uncommon that the patient was going predominantly to one side, which would accentuate how much over eruption there was. 
So my point here is I did not enamelplasty all of the teeth. I enamelplasty the side that was over erupted that was getting in the way of my freeway space. So 24 and 25 are a lot flatter now in relation to the other teeth. Now, when we try the wax rim in, we're able to get his VDR minus three. We get a VDO a proper position. Go ahead and bite down. Take a bite, let everything relax. Bring the teeth together a little more. Good. That's perfect. Also, what I did to give us some space, you know, he's relatively class two. If you notice there that this wax rim had quite a bit of suction, uh, it's not uncommon that I find labs don't place posterior palatal seals in the record bases. Um, I really don't like using denture glues during this step. I don't like using them ever, but I definitely don't like using them during this step. So I would encourage you to work with a lab or at least advocate for your lab to place a posterior palatal seal on the wax rim so that you don't have a uh, denture base that's flopping around in the patient's mouth. If you've done dentures before, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Which accentuated the over eruption of these teeth is I scooped out the inside. So I maintained the incisal edge position of eight and nine, but if I kept reducing the wax rim without there being a scoop or an angle, I would lose that aesthetic spot as I'm chasing the VDR minus three. So this is the critical point here. When you have a lot of over eruption of the lower anterior teeth, um, you have to quote unquote scoop it out in order to balance the aesthetics of where eight and nine or seven through 10 teeth are gonna go aesthetically in the wax rim, but also uh, reduce enough wax that you can bring the patient into occlusion. What we're doing here is we're helping the lab with vertical dimension and aesthetics of where the, the teeth need to go. If we didn't scoop it out this way, we would compromise one and or the other. So I've kind of scooped this all out as we can see. Now I'm ready to go. So I'm gonna make my notches. I'll get his lower wax rim till every, everything touches. Yeah. And then we'll see you on the other side. All right, so the summary points of this case vignette, one, dentures can be difficult. Uh, they're hard enough when the patient presents with what we would maybe quote normal anatomy. Uh, but if you have a curveball or a snake in the grass just waiting to, to make the case difficult, uh, it can be rather frustrating. So our goal here today was to open our eyes into seeing one of those potential pitfalls so that you know how to handle the case moving forward. Compensatory eruption, or as Frank Spear calls it, can complicate removable prosthodontics best to see it before it gives one brain damage. Compensatory eruption, over eruption, changes in occlusal planes, understanding how this happened before you do your, your records to see if it's a case that you should handle or refer to a prosthodontist. Understanding freeway space and its relation to the VDR and the VDO is a critical concept to master. I think we, we've got a pretty good sense of why that is in this case here. Knowing how to modify the wax rim in all dimensions, vertically, creating that oblique angle for the anterior incisals, um, understanding how to use a, uh, a fox plane, understanding the fricatives and where the buccal flanges need to go. All of these things are important because the lab, again, doesn't have the patient's face. They don't have the dy dynamics of how that patient is functioning uh, when they have it in, in their mouth. All they have is a, is a model. And lastly, dentures can be difficult. Yet, Mastery of removable is a critical skill for every practicing dentist. So the point here is that these concepts make us better dentate dentists. So it's very easy to say, I don't need to know this because I'm not going to do dentures. There are some states out there uh, where denturism is a, is a common thing where we can refer them out, uh, give the tough cases to the prosthodontist, but you should know how to do the more straightforward cases or at least have an understanding in the diagnosis so that you treat your patients the way they need to be treated. So I hope this helps. If you have any questions, leave it in the comment section below. Thank you.